Right, I am going to start recording and share my screen. We're going to start with Judy today, who's going to talk with us about uh, our supported employment program within Summit Stone and really the idea or the lens that I would like for us to be thinking about as we're listening to um, Judy today is how we can support our supported employment program as a role for uh, beginning a, or starting a steering committee. So, okay. So you can just let me know next slide. Everyone can see the slides. Whoops. Okay. Um, it's running without. Yeah. No. Okay. Go ahead, Judy. You're on. Okay. Okay. So, um, oh, it's advancing. Yeah, so, it is. Okay. Let me see if I can stop this. Okay. Just do that. Okay. So IPS, it stands for Individual Placement and Support. It's support and employment for adults, adults and youth age 16 to 24 interested in gaining competitive employment. IPS is an evidence-based practice approach to supporting people who want to become employed in regular jobs, and they have their choice of those jobs. Um, when IPS first started, they started with 14 different studies for people with mental health disorders and um, looking at uh, how work impact their mental health. And those studies were done at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. And they found that once people were employed, they were able to maintain their mental health stability longer. So one of the basic principles of IPS is zero exclusion. No one is screened out of our program because of substance use or any criminal history. Everyone who wants to work can work, we believe. And um, therefore we help anyone who we have a referral for from within Summit Stone. So people with serious mental health, substance use, they work in regular jobs uh, based on their preference. Thank you, now. So there are eight principles of IPS and zero exclusion is the biggest one. Um, competitive jobs are the goal. Services are integrated with the mental health treatment team. So right now we have five employment specialists and they are um, embedded in teams throughout Summit Stone. So we have someone at the Wilson office. Allison is at the Wilson office. Bailey is at Bristlecone. Aaron is at Orchard. Taylor and Colleen are spending their time with um, the center office. So we have moved people out into the community, which is where they need to be. Um, personalized benefits planning is provided right now. We don't have a benefits planner, so we use DVR for that service so people can check on how the employment is going to impact their benefits. So those are the first four. Sorry, guys. This is moving way faster than every time I want it to pause, it just moves faster. Sorry. So the job search starts as soon after a person expresses the interest in working. So if someone wants to work, our referral is generated, we get the referral, we try to get them moving fairly quickly. Uh, the sixth is employment specialists build relationships with employers. So we are out in the community doing job development, trying to build relationships with employers, um, getting those meetings, getting second meetings, and possibly then placement for uh, our clients that are interested in that particular type of work. We've done a very good job of looking at a lot of different businesses and being able to um, build relationships so the job development that we're doing is, that is done well. Um, and individual job supports are time unlimited. So if someone says, can we meet once a week for a year after they get a job, we meet once a year for a week after they get a job. So that ongoing support is pretty important because we find a lot of people can get jobs. It's the maintaining the job that's hard. So we can provide those ongoing supports after they get the job to keep them working. So if something comes up, 
reach out to us, talk to us, tell us what's going on. Let us have you sign a release. We can come in and advocate for you. We can try to sit down with your employer and work out a situation. And many times it comes out with a positive income. And then the client preference, client preference, preference is honored. Sorry, I'm functioning on very little sleep today for some reason. Um, so the clients have a choice of what they do. So if somebody comes to us and says, I don't want to work in, in fast food, or I don't want to work in doing janitorial, or I don't want to work in retail, we don't even look at those jobs. We figure out what it is that they're interested in and what it is they want to do. And usually we can come up with a plan that they're happy with and find them uh, help them find a position that meets their needs. Um, so those are the eight principles of IPS, just so you have a general overview of those. Do you want to move to the next one? Actually, I can too. So, so um, this, this PowerPoint is one that I use when we talk to our therapists here at Summit Stone, like new therapists. So this has a little bit of information for that. So we'll just kind of go through it. So what happens if someone says to a therapist that they want to work, we have a referral form that's generated and then the referral is sent to a um, email inbox we have. We process all the referrals. Some of those referrals go to the clubhouse, some of them go to IPS, and then we move through that. Um, I talked already about IPS did studies for people with mental health and they are able to maintain their mental health stability longer. They also did studies later on that um, for people who have substance use disorders and found that when people working with substance use disorders, they are able to decrease their substance use. And I've talked to a couple of our clients that I have relationships with and I, in my mind, I always think more money, more use. And they say no, because what happens is we feel like we're in a rut we can't get out of. And so that's why we use. And once they have a job, that gives them something to look forward to. So they're able to decrease their substance use. So that's a pretty positive aspect of IPS, I think. So anyone who thinks they have a client who's a good fit or says they want to work, the therapists or um, case managers can generate a referral and we can start working with those, those folks. Um, so the referral is in our S drive. That's probably something you all don't really need to know, but it is kept there and uh, the therapist can access, they fill it out and then send it. So that's just one of those extra slides. And then I have actual, the referral is in our, the PowerPoint. So you yeah, can I see that what the referral looks like, okay. So services that IPS um, can provide is we do the general intake. We help them to build a resume. We can do practice interviews. We've developed a really nice um, relationship with ENT Credit Union, and we have their um, person in Denver, their recruiter, who is doing mock interviews for us when we have people that may just need some help with interviewing and want to work with somebody that's a professional that can give them pointers. Um, we do job searching, job development, placement, coaching, advocacy, post-employment support, um, inter informational interviews. We can take them out in the community or if there's a business they're interested in, we can set up informational interviews that they can just gain knowledge and information. And we work with DVR um, the Division of Voc Rehab Services. So we can, we can, we work very closely with Andrea so we provide those services as well. So for employment, and Andrea is really good. We, um, with DVR partnership, we get help with interview clothing, shoes, 
Somebody may need a bus pass. Somebody may be going to school. Gas may be an issue. We can get transportation paid for to support them with their employment for a short period of time. Uh, and DVR can help with glasses, hearing aids, anything that might be a barrier to their employment while they're on the job. Um, and then we do education and training with DVR. We can do certificate programs, associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees. I have one lady right now that's starting school in January to do a master's degree. Um, we can do CDL licenses, internships, apprenticeships. So a lot of different things to provide these folks, maybe some training that they, they haven't ever had or would like to pursue more of a career than just a job. So we can look at those things as well. So we do. And even though they are in school, we still meet with them regularly, check in. Um, I have one young lady who is going to school and last year she had a 4.0 and is on the Dean's list, but she struggled getting a job. So it just, maybe that, it was just time for her to be able to focus on her education. So she's doing that and has done very well. So this is just my helpful tips for job seekers. If you're trying to find work and you're on the computer to find a quiet space to work, set a, reg a regular schedule, and then think about what do I need to be successful? Do I need interview prep? Do I need job search help? Do I need help navigating applications on the computer? These are all things we can also assist with. I like to tell people, I, I remember I worked for DVR um, for almost five years um, and they had a jobs book. I, and I remember picking it up and looking at it and it, it was about 2012, so the economy wasn't great then. But their advice in that book was to apply for five jobs a day, five days a week. And then not only applying for jobs and, and um, doing that five days a week, but the follow-up with the applications, the keeping up on your email every day, looking at those things. And at that point, it said, if you applied for 100 jobs a month, within three to six months, you should be employed. I think our economy is a little bit better than it was back then, so it's probably not quite that severe, but um, it just laid out a plan for how to approach looking for work that I thought was very practical. So um, sometimes those things are easy to, to use as well, just different tools that we might have. So, so how can we partner with you? Um, so this is more for the therapist, communicate client needs. We do uh, keep in contact with the client's therapist. If things come up, we have questions. Uh, therapists ask questions. We are very much a part of that integrated team. We like to reach out if we are, you know, have somebody who has kind of missed a couple appointments. Is there something going on? Have they relapsed? Are, are they hospitalized? What can we do to support them in this time? How can we partner with you to, to re-engage them? That sort of thing. So um, anything that they think would help us to understand the client that will assist them, that's always good. Um, a lot of times when I first get referrals, I like to ask, do you for, prefer to work with a male or a female? Some people have it really have a strong opinion about who they'd like to work with. So we try to um, make that happen as much as possible. And then let us know when your client gets employed. So that's a big one. Sometimes people get their job and they they just um, kind of fall off the the map. They that's that was their goal. They've got it, they're done. Um, but they don't provide us the information and we like to have that information, especially with DVR. That's how their success is measured by how many people get employed. So we need that information. Um, and let's know, let us know how we can best meet the needs of your client. Um, clients have different needs. They have different, some only can use the bus. Um, so they need a job that's close to home. So how are we going to do that? Um, communicate what's working well and what's not. If 
If we're going down a path that you think is not the right path for the client, let us know. Let's sit down, three of us, the client, the employment specialist, and the therapist and have a conversation about why that's not a good path and what we can do to like change our course, but keep them with doing something that they really like and they're interested in. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, that's so awesome. that's that's my last slide. I don't know if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, but we're open for that. Judy, can you, um, so the steering committee is part of IPS Fidelity. And so that's one thing that when we first brought IPS into Summit Stone, we had a steering committee, but that has over the years just dissolved. It's something that the state is really encouraging us to do again. And so what I'd like to do since IPS is part of that umbrella of Spirit Crossing, um, looking at uh, at least having some, some level or element of a steering committee. So Judy, can you talk to the group about what, what the role of the st steering committee is? If you're familiar with that, or I, I can do it, but if you've done a little work related to the fidelity and if you heard anything during our recent fidelity review, it would be helpful for this group to hear so that we can kind of identify what makes the most sense for this advisory board. You know, I'm not sure I've heard a whole lot and I haven't focused on the advisory council for the fidelity review. I'm, I'm more, this is how where we need to improve. This is where we need to improve where, with our client services. But I guess in my head, I just see the, the advisory board um, just kind of helping to guide us in the right direction, community resources or business people that get us out in the community and that we can engage with. I think we've done, now that we have a larger staff, we're doing a much better job with the job development piece and building those relationships in the community, but I would like to see us build stronger relationships. Um, earlier, in the year, I guess it's been two or three months ago, we identified 25 employers that we'd like to build relationships with. Some of them are those larger corporations that have probably a more broad area of employment that we can look at for entry level, like administrative positions or things like that. And we always have people who are wanting those types of jobs. We just don't have a lot of contact in the community with businesses that supply those types of, of positions. So for me, if I just think if we had some community leaders or business leaders who um, could advise on how to get the, your foot in the door, hey, I know this person here. Why don't you go why don't you go to that business and see if you can talk to this person? I'll make a phone call or send an email, kind of that type of thing. So that's part of it. The other part of the steering committee is that the steering committee really monitors the fidelity of the program and helps the program to achieve as high as level of a fidelity um, as possible in relationship to um, the work that Summit Stone is doing. Um, is the IPS team integrated into the clinical teams, for example, or um, do the executive leadership have a good understanding of the IPS model? Um, is communication about the IPS program getting across the agency or is it staying, you know, within just the spirit crossing umbrella, for example? So there's um, representatives from Summit Stone that need to be a part of the steering committee as well. Are quality assurance reviews happening? Are those chart reviews happening regularly? That's really kind of the role and the intent of the steering committee is to make sure that the IPS program is being integrated into the broader behavioral health organization as, as possible. So that's the other piece to it. Any questions for Judy about the IPS program? And what that looks like. 
a bit of history, and I think I've shared this with you all before, is that really we brought IPS into Summit Stone to hit a couple of different needs. One, the clubhouse really needed to improve the level of supported employment that we were doing. IPS methods and the IPS model really gives us that better structure and we needed to be able to serve more people. And so giving Summit Stone clients the choice, do they want those all encompassing holistic support services from the clubhouse that they can get or do they just need to find that competitive employment in the community? Meanwhile, we're also receiving additional funding by being able to serve that substance use population that the clubhouse can't necessarily serve unless they have a co-occurring disorder. So the IPS program can serve individuals that have substance use disorder um, diagnoses only because the state is paying for those, those services. So one, we're wanting to give those clients as many choices and opportunities as possible serving as many people as possible. And we've been able to do that. Like Judy said, we've expanded the team. There are now five employment specialists across the agency. The clubhouse is still working on making sure that we're providing those supported employment services to our clubhouse members. Sometimes there is overlap. Sometimes we have clubhouse members that are also working with an IPS employment specialist. So there's a lot of partnering that we're doing you know, between the two teams as well. And that's why I want to make sure that we're keeping that broader umbrella of Spirit Crossing as the, the bigger group. And then we have a clubhouse and then supported employment team underneath that umbrella. So does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Any questions? Giving you that piece of history. Okay. Well, thank you, Judy. Thanks for taking the time. I have a busy schedule today, so. No, it you sounds it. like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the ask is for the advisory council to keep employment more in mind and not just for Clubhouse, but also for other Summit Stone clients who might be getting services from IPS. Yeah, the ask is really to help identify how we can create a formal steering committee for the IPS team. And does it make sense to start with our advisory council? So that conversation can be had in November when we meet again in November. And I asked Amber Weber to come today to really kind of educate the advisory council on what what the role of advisory boards, board of directors within the, the Clubhouse International organization looks like and um, some of the goals that she has for the employment focused part of the Clubhouse program in general, so yeah. The me? <laughs> um, yeah, if you're ready, I think so, since we don't have any other questions, yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. Um, can I share my screen? I sure can. I think you can, yes. I think I can. Okay, let's see here. That's not the screen I wanted to share. Well, shucks. Let's try again. <laughs> let's try again. Okay. So like Natalie said, um, I I'm with Clubhouse International, so I'm really kind of invested and involved in spirit crossing as the clubhouse, um, recognizing and knowing that the summit stone is the kind of auspice or, um, parent agency and, um, and really what we're focusing on is very similar to, there's a lot of crossover with IPS and clubhouse, um, and the kinds of services that we offer and, and, um, IPS does something called Fidelity and Clubhouse International does something called accreditation. Um, we're also an evidence-based model, but our um, evidence is, so we're based on um, meeting accreditation guidelines, which is our Clubhouse 37 standards. Um, and if you're not familiar with the standards, I'm sure Natalie can provide you a copy of them. But the standards are really what guides our accreditation and evidence-based process. Um, 
And so as advisory board to Spirit Crossing, that's what I've got here right now. Yeah. Advisory board to Spirit yeah. Crossing. Okay. Um, for, I just want to, first of all, say thank you for your commitment to the clubhouse um, and for your knowledge of the clubhouse model. And you are the folks that are stewarding the vision and the mission. And at the same time, you are lending your skills and your talents to um, helping Spirit Crossing continue to remain, you know, in good standing with the fidelity of IPS, with Clubhouse accreditation, and just, you know, ensuring great um, services are provided to the members of Spirit Crossing Clubhouse. So, you know, just right off the bat, thank you for your for your commitment and dedication. Um, boards and advisory boards, they have a commitment to the Clubhouse, and that's the biggest thing is to provide this connective tissue that binds the Clubhouse to the community. Clubhouses are most successful when they are really engaged in their community and the community knows about them and they know what's going on in the community. Um, and there's that visibility piece and, and clubhouse um, advisory boards and boards are the, are the folks, they're the community connectors. And you're also that ambassadors and the advocates for the clubhouse. And so some of the important things that you do as an advisory board is to ensure that you are you understand clubhouse standards and kind of the model and that you are advising for long range planning. So things like, you know, as you're coming across and you're needing to have, um, you know, a steering committee for IPS or, you know, an, a development committee for employment of some kind, you know, that the board is involved in that and that you're also really involved in just understanding the financial health of the clubhouse. Now, I know you're not, um, responsible for it, but you are there to advocate for the financial health and the long range planning of spirit crossing. So strategic planning, um, and that, and that you are also committed to understanding and supporting the clubhouse model, because that's what spirit crossing is. It's a clubhouse doing a lot of really amazing things and incorporating IPS into the clubhouse model is really fantastic. And, and it seems like it has been incredibly helpful for spirit crossing. So, the board knowing and understanding all of those moving pieces is really important and helpful. I always look at clubhouses as a three-legged stool made up of members, staff, and the board or advisory board. And if you take away one of the stool, the legs of the stool, it's not very um, secure and it's very weak and shaky. But if you have those three legs, then you have a firm, solid clubhouse. And so the members and the staff um, and the board all work together to create a long vision, term vision for the clubhouse. And then the board gets to be the keeper of that vision. You know, staff come and go, members come and go. But the consistent thing is that the that Spirit Crossing has a, you know, advisory board that is the keeper of the vision. So Clubhouse International Standard Number 33 talks about how the clubhouse has an independent board or advisory board. Um, and you are uniquely positioned to provide financial, legal, legislative, employment development. I highlighted that. Um, consumer and community support and advocacy for the clubhouse. And so a lot of clubhouses really work to focus on creating a, a board or advisory board with individuals that can provide these supports and goals. So, you know, I don't know everybody on your board, but from here, there's definitely a strong employment focus that I can, I can see. And so that's incredible that Spirit Crossing has the employment support that is needed. Um, some clubhouses, like I know the, the clubhouses I've been in, we always struggled to find someone that was there for legal or legislative because, you know, it's just hard to find an attorney and you know, a legislative person, but we did the best we could. And um, this is something to aspire to for clubhouses. But I want to talk to you about the um, employment at this point, because that's my role at Clubhouse International as the employment program officer. Um, and one of the things that we say in the clubhouse model all the time is that employment is the cornerstone of the model. And as a right of, of membership, so for members to have, they have a lot of, you know, rights as part of being a member of the clubhouse. And one of those is to be able to return to paid employment in, in the community in an integrated work setting, whether that's through transitional employment, which I'll explain that in a minute, or supported or independent employment, which Judy just did an excellent job of explaining how Spirit Crossing is working and collaborating with IPS to provide those supports. 
Um, but employment is that foundational part of the clubhouse and um, it really does so many more things than just help our members work. And Judy mentioned earlier in her presentation that, you know, people that work, there's, it's evidence that they are less likely to be involved in isolating, less likely to be involved in the criminal justice system and the substance use or homelessness. So we feel the same way at Clubhouse International that working just provides this, um, it's critical and it provides members the ability to reduce isolation and, and reduce their poverty um, and have you know support in their community. So one of the things that Clubhouse International does that nobody else does is something called transitional employment. Um, transitional employment is essentially, and, and Nat and Trinity just jump in if I miss anything because you guys know it too. Transitional employment is really a very entry level um, employment kind of model or program. It's not intended for um, members to get a career out of transitional employment like IPS does. IPS kind of moves people towards um, full-time career employment. Transitional employment's different. It's really there for members to dip their toe in the world of work. For many of the clubhouse members, they haven't had the opportunity to work or they've had really difficult you know, situations with employment. They've had bad experiences um, doing you know, employment kind of in the traditional realm. So clubhouses, provide opportunities for members to get employment in the community through a very supported, collaborative um, opportunity with businesses in the community. So as Judy was mentioning earlier, you know, we're always looking for people to connect. Who do you know? Who, who do you know that owns a business? Who do you know that, you know, runs a, a restaurant? You know, those are the kinds of connections we need. But with transitional employment, it's very specific to the clubhouse. It's entry level, 12 to 20 hours a week. Um, at least minimum wage, the jobs are diverse. So we're not just having everyone in janitorial, um, but the clubhouse is responsible to diversify their positions. Um, the position is managed by the clubhouse. So it's not a position that's owned by the member. It's temporary six to nine months in duration. And at that point, when a member is finished, they will you know, rotate another clubhouse member in. Um, and looking at our guidelines here, clubhouse international accreditation guidelines are such that 20% of the average daily attendance of a clubhouse should be employed in transitional employment. And at least half of those jobs should be 12 to 20 hours a week. So what we consider vocationally significant. Um, and that there's that um, clubhouses are making them diverse so that they're not all at the same place. Um, now we know transitional employment is not a career. It's not meant to be. It's supposed to be an opportunity for members to build up their confidence and purpose and to be able to feel like they can be successful in a, in a job where they're highly supported by the clubhouse. And the clubhouse trains the member, selects the member, trains the member on the job, and then supports the member. So an example of support is if a member calls in sick and can't go to work, one of the clubhouse staff would leave the clubhouse and go cover that position for the members so that they don't run the risk of losing that position, which has been something that has happened very frequently, I'm sure, in their past. And so um, we make a commitment to the employer that the, the job is always covered and um, the member can feel more secure in knowing that they can go to work and be supported by the clubhouse. Nat and Trinity, did I miss anything transitional employment wise? Got it? Okay. Um, yeah. So so that is one thing that's unique to Clubhouse is transitional employment. And then we have um, supported and independent employment, which really kind of moves into that IPS realm. And it sounds like Spirit Crossing is very, very involved and invested in the IPS model, and it's going really well for you. And so just so you know, on the advisory board, not all Clubhouses do the IPS model. This is something that, I don't know, Nat, what do you say, 60, maybe 60 Clubhouses in the U.S.? Yeah, that's probably it. I haven't seen the results of that survey yet, so. I don't okay. Know. Oh, yeah. Did you not get? Okay, I'll have to send it to you. Um, we did send out a survey to all of the clubhouses because IPS model is an international model as well as clubhouse. So about a year ago, we sent out a survey just trying to identify and understand who does IPS, um, you know, to see if there's a more of an opportunity for collaboration. And so we're gathering data and we're trying to learn more about um, who does it and who and how do they do it and how do they integrate it into the clubhouse and um, Spirit Crossing, the Colorado clubhouses are kind of the leaders in a lot of ways in implementing IPS into the clubhouse model. So for supported and independent employment, whether you do IPS or not in, um, in a clubhouse, 
We also have accreditation guidelines, which are that 50% of the clubhouses average daily attendance should be um, employed. And um, so at, at least 15 hours a week or more. And at, at that point, 12 and a half um, percent of those employed should have obtained their job within the last year so that we're not um, kind of remaining stagnant and keep using the same members as our as our data every year that we're actively supporting and assisting members every year to get um, jobs in the community. And so this is what clubhouses will um, meet or supposed to meet for accreditation um, through Clubhouse International. So kind of going back before I proceed, do you guys have any questions about um, kind of the guidelines and what Clubhouse is doing, Clubhouse International is doing employment wise? Seem pretty clear. Okay. So kind of like Judy had mentioned, um, we're always looking for the board, the advisory boards to support and assist the clubhouse in employment development and employment in general. As we went back to that slide, slide number, standard number 33, um, one of the things that we look for in our advisory boards is that they're involved in employment development. So I just listed a bunch of ways that advisory boards might be able to be involve themselves. I know a lot of times boards and advisory boards are often feeling like they need to feel more needed. <laughs> and I always say employment's the first way to do it because it's it's kind of an amazing um, opportunity to get yourself involved in the, not only the community, but the clubhouse. So some of the ideas for involvement that you can do on, on your level is um, to work with the staff and members in hosting maybe like a clubhouse open house. And I know that a lot of clubhouses think, oh, that's only if you're brand new. No, like have one every year um, so that your community knows who you are. We always talk about clubhouse being the best kept secret, and we don't want to be the best kept secret anymore. We want our community to know who we are and what we do and how we can involve the community. So working alongside the clubhouse to you know, have an open house and inviting your friends, colleagues, neighbors, um, connections to that open house just to learn more. Um, I'm sure Natalie is involved in this because she's very involved in the community, but attending or presenting at Rotary, um, Clubhouse Rotary meetings, Chamber of Commerce, Kiwanis Clubs, you know, those different kind of membership organizations are really, really powerful because that's where your movers and shakers are. If you think about Rotary, they're, they're all business people. Um, I know for me, when I was a director of a clubhouse um, here in Utah, I, we had three rotaries in our community and every year I would just make the rounds and I would do a clubhouse presentation every single year um, to all three of them and talk about what we did and who we are because they, init they inevitably get new members um, to their rotary. But also I left with, a, with an ask, you know, I asked them to consider be one, being on our advisory board because clubhouses always need new board members and two, you know, your business connected. So help us to you know, get employment opportunities with your businesses. Um, so Rotaries and, and Chamber of Commerce are amazing. Um, I had board members who would host house parties and they'd invite their neighbors and their friends and they'd have hors d'oeuvres and they'd, bring, they'd invite a member to share, you know, kind of their experience in the clubhouse. And it was just a really great kind of casual, low key way to share the word. And, you know, we're not looking for money here. We're looking for connecting again, networking and, and community connection. Um, if you haven't already done so, invite your family, friends, neighbors to the clubhouse for a tour and lunch. I think we underutilize lunch sometimes, and it's a really great way for us to come and see the busyness of, of the, the clubhouse and see the members in action and um, have lunch and a tour. Um, collaborate with the staff and members, maybe hosting an employer dinner, um, or other recognition event, you know, with how much Spirit Crossing is involved with the community in IPS. This might be a really great opportunity for Judy and her team or IPS folks to come together and just host a recognition dinner for every employer that employs the members and thank them for their involvement with um, Spirit Crossing. And then we're going to talk in a second, and I think this kind of is along the same lines as your, um, as your steering committee. Um, but I always encourage clubhouses that maybe are looking for employment development to create, I call it an ad hoc committee or employment development committee, very similar to what you're talking about, the steering committee, it sounds like. Um, the ad hoc committee really should just be <clears throat> anyone who's heavily involved in employment. So maybe that's Judy, maybe that's your voc rehab person, 
um, the clubhouse director, Trinity, member leaders, um, your you know folks from from um, the auspice agency, um, and and board members, and get together and create a committee that is committed to employment development, whether it's transitional employment or supported or independent employment. And you're really focusing on the networking, who you know. And this committee should be, you know, not very long. I'd say no more than six months. Really kind of light a fire under yourselves, make some really pretty audacious goals um, and work towards, you know, employment development at the clubhouse. So my story and how, how this happened for me was I was an employment coordinator at Alliance House in Salt Lake City. And we were about six months out of being accredited. And I looked at our our employment opportunities and realized that we were low. You know, when I look back at those guidelines that we talked about earlier, we weren't meeting the guidelines. And I was like, oh crap, what am I going to do? So I went to my supervisor and she said, we need to get a committee together. So we got a couple of board members. I co-chaired it with one of the board members, someone from our voc rehab office, um, great members on the board. We had, I think, a local business join us that was hiring members at the time. And we created this committee and we identified the purpose. Why are we here? We're here because we need employment opportunities for our members. What are we looking at right now? We don't have as many TEs, SEs, and IEs as we would like. Here's where we are right now. Um, we reviewed the employment guidelines, the ones that we just went through a couple minutes ago. And then I shared with them what I'd been doing. You know, I've been developing at this place and that place and so-and-so, this is how it's going. I'm not getting a call back. I'm, I'm in great communication with this employer. Um, and then we sat around and talked about our wish list. And it was really kind of phenomenal. The One of the board members was a um, partner at her law firm. So she said, I really would love to try and get my law firm to come on board with this. Um, one of the board members was a, a manager of a restaurant and he was part of the restaurant association. So he said, at my next meeting, I'm going to go and tell them all about Clubhouse and see if they're interested in, you know, connecting and collaborating with the clubhouse. And so at the end of the meeting, everybody left with homework of who are we going to connect with? Um, and then their job was to do that. And then we got together again in two weeks and they were supposed to come back and report. So again, it's it's not one of those things where it's just like, okay, yeah, if you would, that'd be great. People are kind of on the spot to make sure that they do their community connection. What came of this was a couple of things. One, we got a new transitional employment placement at a restaurant that just opened up and Alliance House, this was years ago, by the way, Alliance House still has that position. It's been, they've had it since 2011. Um, so we're going on what, 12 years. Um, and then the other thing that happened was, is that they were able to get a transitional employment position with the law firm that the board member was a partner of. And that was a really cool like development. Um, but had we not had this meeting, we wouldn't, or this, this committee, we wouldn't have been able to make those connections. Board members didn't understand their role. Then after they got onto this committee, they understood their role and they were able to make those network connections. Um, you have influence. And so this is where you use your sphere of influence. So again, who do you know? Who, um, are you connected with your HR department? Do you have a family member who manages or owns or is involved in a local business? Do your neighbors know about what you do um, and who and why you're involved with Spirit Crossing? And do they own businesses or are they like a pastor of a church or something like that? We've already talked about the networking of the rotaries and all of that. Um, what are businesses that you frequent on a regular basis? This is where your sphere of influence really comes in. So here's a story. Um, at the last clubhouse I was at, we were, it's in Park City, Utah, and I was the executive director and I was there for four years. And three of the first four years I was there, I didn't even want to think about employment development because I was just trying to get a clubhouse up off the ground. But on year three, my board chair came to me and she says, I'm bringing someone over to take a tour. He owns three sandwich shops in our community. I was like, cool, how do you know him? Oh, my husband goes in every single day for lunch. And he's struck, he's, um, strike, he's been striking up a friendship. There's this connection. And I went in with him one day and I just told him about what I've been doing. I'm on the board of this clubhouse. And I told him about clubhouse and now he wants to learn more. 
So she brings him over and he walks in and the first thing he sees is our commercial kitchen. And he's like, wow, this is so cool. What do you do here? And so I use that opportunity to explain the members make lunch every day and they menu plan and they clean up and they go grocery shopping. And he was like blown away at the fact that the members were involved in that detail of lunch at the clubhouse. And he could, I could see in his brain, he was thinking, how can I get these members that are already learning the skill here at my at the clubhouse over to my businesses. So we chatted, he sat at the dining room table and we just talked about employment and how cool it would be to partner. And he said, I'll let you know, I'll call you back tomorrow. 9 a.m. gives me a call and he says, I'm in. And he ended up, we ended up having our first transitional employment placement with them. And then he went on to hire two other members in a supported employment capacity. So they were there permanently um, working for his sandwich shops. And so it was all just because our board chair's husband had a conversation at a restaurant that he frequented every single day. So we think it's hard. We think it's like, uh, but it's not really just opening up your mouth and saying, I am involved on this board and I'm really excited about it. And I want to tell you about what I've been doing for people to then go, Oh my gosh, like this is how we can make a connection. And you don't have to do any of the development. That's why you have Judy. That's why you have Trinity. That's why you have Nat. They're the ones that can do it. All we're asking for you is to make that network, that connection. Um, so I kind of gave you my, my experience about it. Um, I just want to tell you the, the board about the, the law firm connection. So our board chair, our board member at the time was a partner to law firm. She went to back to her law firm and said, I really want us to participate in, in this employment opportunity. Um, and then they got on board. But the thing is, is they didn't really have necessarily something. They created something that that they were missing. So when you think about going to a law firm, you have to be like a paralegal or an attorney, or you have to have some like a legal secretary with lots and lots of training. And so when we went and talked to them, they said, oh, you know, we don't really have anything for you. And the question I asked was, who are the five busiest people here and what don't they get done? And he started thinking, and he's the, this was the, the office manager. He started thinking, he goes, well, we have about, you know, three feet of legal um, documents that we haven't been able to bind. And um, our mail gets delivered really late. No one's there to clean up the conference rooms after meetings. And I said, great, let's combine them. That's a TE right there for us, transitional employment. And we ended up doing that. And um, I don't know if any of you are coming to the conference in Salt Lake in the next three weeks, but you're going to be blown away at one of the keynote speakers who was the very first person we placed on that TE. And she's gonna share with you her story and where she is now. She's still there by the way, and it's been eight years, but she's in a different capacity and her story is phenomenal. So I just wanted to share this, these with you because I think that you guys are in a position and a capacity to be able to really support Spirit Crossing and their goals for employment. And, and I need to say to Spirit Crossing, you guys sound like you're doing a phenomenal job with your employment. Um, and it's always just takes a team effort to um, ensure that our members are getting the opportunities that they need. So, you know, thank you for your time. And I just want to open it up to see if you have any questions for me about Clubhouse and employment. Great, Amber, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Any thoughts? You know, Andrea, you've been part of our community for a very long time. Did anything spark any thoughts for you? Or oh, you're muted. Andrea, you're muted. Hello. Yeah. You know, not really. I pretty much, you know, I have a good grasp on it because I've been part of the community for so long. It's it's good to have that refresher and hear um, what's going on with Clubhouse International. And um, I would like to know more about this person that that uh, has this position, whoever. I'm sure somebody from Clubhouse is going to be going. So I would like to know more about that. It's just piqued my curiosity. Yeah, okay. We'll be sure to bring back the report. Yeah. Okay. I'm fairly new to this board and I learned so much today. So thank you for all the information um, <clears throat> and kind of breaking it down and synthesizing it. I really appreciate it. Welcome to the board. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that your ideas are, um, I mean, the tangible ideas are so helpful. Thank you. Okay, any thoughts from you, Judy? So just a lot of steering committee. Yeah, I think just a lot of good information, Amber. A lot of things that, you know, making those community connections. You know, Andrea and I, we go to a couple of restaurants every week. <laughs> maybe think about, maybe we yes, need we to do. Those, <laughs> talking to those owners. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for sharing your information. I feel like there's a lot of like cross collaboration there. And, and, and because of that, I see why Spirit Crossing and Summit Stone has really worked to incorporate IPS and the clubhouse model together. They're very, very similar in so many ways. And so thank you so much for, you know, the support that you're doing for the supported and independent folk, you know, folks that are looking for work. Yeah, I think it's very similar. You know, we're always looking for that connection in the business community. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much. This gives us a lot to think about when we meet in November and, um, you know, start identifying some strategies around um, what we need to be doing to move forward in the next year for both the clubhouse and supporting the IPS program as well. So thanks so much, Amber. Appreciate your time. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. See you in a couple of weeks. Safe travels. Take care. Bye. All right. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. I'll get, I'll make sure that this gets sent out to the whole group. So yeah.